This is a collection of my airbrushes that I've been building up over the last 10 to 12 years. In no way is this comprehensive, but this is going to be my 2022 airbrush buyer's guide. A few things that it's important for me to go over is first of all, I bought every single one of these with my own money. No brand or company had any say in these reviews. Secondly, this doesn't cover every single brand. There's brands that I want to pick up like Grex, Sparmax, Hansa. They all look really great. I just haven't gotten around to buying them yet, but I will eventually and add them to the channel. And lastly, and most importantly, these are just my opinions. In no way do I think my opinions are the correct ones and not everyone is going to agree with me. And that's a good thing. I think in time we all develop our favorites with our painting tools and I'm no different. I'm just a guy on YouTube but I'll do my best to try to keep this as objective as possible. And I just want to point out that this channel is a fine art channel where I show you how to do paintings like these portraits that you're looking at now. And I'm also well aware that a lot of modelers and miniature painters watch this channel. So of course, be aware that I'm talking about these in relation to what I do, which is visual art, but this information will apply to all applications of painting with an airbrush. I will say this, there's not a single airbrush on this table that I wouldn't buy again. Every single one of these airbrushes is a double action airbrush, which are the only ones that I use. But with every airbrush you see here, there's things I like and things I don't with each and every one. So let's get started. I broke these airbrushes up into four different groups to help differentiate them. On the left side of the screen, we have the detail airbrushes. In the center, we have what I would consider to be general use airbrushes. On the upper right hand side of the screen, we also have general use airbrushes, but these are for wider spray applications. And on the lower right hand side of the screen we have the inexpensive airbrushes. There's a lot of different brands that sell these but to me they all feel very similar and nearly identical. This video is part one so in this one we're only going to be talking about the general use airbrushes and in next week's video we're going to be looking at the detail airbrushes. For the detail airbrushes, we have the GSI Creos PS771, the Iwata Custom Micron CMB, the Iwata Custom Micron Takumi, the Badger Sotar 2020 Slim, and the Badger Sotar 2020, the Harder and Steenbeck Infinity CR Plus with the new 0.15 millimeter needle, and the original Harder and Steenbeck Infinity with a version 1.2 millimeter needle. For the general use airbrushes, the first one I have here is the Neo for Iwata. We also have the Iwata Eclipse HPCS, the Iwata High Performance Plus HPB, the Badger Patriot 105, the Badger Extreme Patriot 105, and the Creos PS276. For the general use wider spray airbrushes, we have the Iwata HPTH. We also have the Pache Talon and Harbor Freight's Central Pneumatic Airbrush, which also fits into the last category of the inexpensive airbrushes. Here we have Master Airbrush. This is called the Master Performance G233, the Point Zero Airbrush. We also have this one called the HD470. And finally, this one, which doesn't even have a name on it. Let's begin with the general use airbrushes. And the first one we have here is the Neo for Iwata. The Neo has a standard airbrush nozzle size of 0.35 millimeters. And with an airbrush needle size like this, it's kind of like the sweet spot for an airbrush because you can definitely get in and spray very tight very small detail but also it's going to be more forgiving for some of the thicker paint that you don't reduce as much. I think the Neo for Iwata is one of the most unique airbrushes out there today. It's got so many cool features to it and it's pretty inexpensive too. It's about half the price of an Iwata Eclipse. One of my favorite features that you rarely see on airbrushes is a removable paint cup. It comes with two in the box and you could swap out the larger one for the smaller one. Swapping to the smaller cup you have some more room for your trigger finger and also you have a little bit better view of the artwork that you're painting. The other famous brand that uses a removable paint cup is Harder and Steambeck's Infinity line and I noticed that these cups are interchangeable. The thread is the same on both of them so you could swap them out if you want but of course I recommend sticking with the ones that are designed for each individual airbrush. But I have to say that I kind of wish that every single gravity fed airbrush had a removable paint cup because it just gives the painter so many more options. I'd love to see other brands like Iwata start including this on their Eclipse line because if you want to swap to a smaller cup you have to buy another $200 airbrush. Another great feature of a removable paint cup that I don't hear anyone really talk about is that you can replace it when the chrome wears out within it. 
If you look at my Awada Eclipse here, which is like 12, 13 years old, the chrome is basically gone from inside this cup. So if it was removable, I'd be able to swap this one out and put a brand new one in there. Compared to the Iwata Eclipse, the Neo is very similar. I'd have to say that the Iwata Eclipse definitely has a better build quality, but not by much. The Neo for Iwata is still excellent. If I had to find one negative of the Neo for Iwata, it would be that you have this old school nozzle design where it's connected to the body of the airbrush. This is not a big deal, only if you're swapping out the nozzle. It's very small and it's easy to break when you're removing it or placing a new one back on. There's nothing wrong with this nozzle design. It's very sturdy. It sprays well. The only issue comes when you have to swap out the nozzle if you break it. Again, that's not that often. Um, you'll see later that the Iwata High Performance Plus, which goes for around $200, has the same design. I prefer a floating nozzle like the Iwata Eclipse or the Badger Patriot 105, but that's just my opinion. So let's move along to the painting test, and the first thing we're checking here is the response rate. It doesn't matter what the lines or the dots look like, I'm just checking how far I have to pull back on the trigger in order to get paint. I'd consider the response rate on the Neo for Iwata to be excellent. You can see that I'm barely even pulling back on the trigger to get paint. Moving along to a spray consistent consistency test. I'm just spraying a thin long line here, seeing how well it atomizes the paint to see if there's any skipping or any sort of clogs in the nozzle. And you can see here we have a perfect continuous line, so it's spraying excellent. In the full reviews for all these airbrushes, I measured the spray angle and the airspeed. So you can see here the spray angle for the Neo is around 18 degrees. A spray angle like this is excellent to get in small detail, and also if you need to spray some wider lines like I'm doing right here. The edges of these wider lines are very smooth. You can see that there's no stippling along the edges, so it's doing a great job at atomizing it. Bringing up this other chart, you can see the airspeed that I measured at 20 psi at around 3.5 inches away. This is one of my favorite features of the Neo, is that it has a very low airspeed at a higher PSI. I measured a number identical to the custom Micron at 4 meters per second. A low airspeed is excellent for detail work, because when you get in very close, you don't feel the air blowing back off the surface you're painting. You know, if you're painting a picture, you're not going to feel it blowing off the canvas, or if you're painting a small model or a miniature, you're not going to feel that air blowing it, you know, trying to almost push it away. This is also going to help give you more control and confidence, because it's going to keep the paint exactly where you spray it. With a higher airspeed and reduced paint, you may notice that you may get some spidering effects or the paint is kind of just blowing across the surface because that airspeed's too high. But when it's lower like this, you can really reduce your paint and feel confident that wherever you place it, it's going to stay. I'm going to be painting these small, cheesy, kind of kitschy landscapes here just to get a sense of each airbrush. And this way I can tell you more about my opinions about how each one performs and how well each one sprays. I'm spraying Createx illustration colors here at 20 PSI and I didn't reduce any of this paint. The Neo sprays flawlessly. It's exactly what you'd want from any airbrush. I'm still shocked that this one goes for around 60 to 70 US dollars. I'd almost consider the Neo for Iwata like a, a, a detail version of the Iwata Eclipse just because it has a lower airspeed. I'd say you probably have some more versatility with the Eclipse because you could spray some thicker paints like base coats through that. That higher airspeed is just going to help you on that. But on this one, if you're looking for some detail work and you want an inexpensive airbrush, the Neo is definitely one to check out. But even with spraying unreduced white right out of the bottle, which is an opaque color, I didn't have any problems with this. Really great control. Excellent airbrush. The next airbrush up is probably one of the most popular models today. This is the Iwata Eclipse HPCS. The HPCS has always been one of my favorite airbrushes of all time. It's built like a tank. It's very easy to break down and clean, and the chrome finishing on it is very durable. And of course, if you're interested in seeing full breakdowns, make sure you check out the full reviews of each one of these airbrushes. The nozzle size of the HPCS is the same as the Neo at 0.35 millimeters. And with this one, you could really get in, get some very tight detail, very thin lines, and also it's a bit more forgiving with those thicker paints. You could spray them through this without reducing them or diluting them, and they spray just fine right out of the bottle. This model I have is well over 10 years old, and you can see inside the cup here, some of that chrome just wore away at the bottom. When you get one of these brand new, the chrome finishing is phenomenal. Iwata is just one of the best brands out there for their finishing and their chrome. So if you've been painting with the Eclipse for a long time and the chrome starts to wear out, it's honestly just aesthetics. It still sprays just as well as it did the day I bought it. On the rear handle, you have this cutaway. The purpose of this is to flush out any clogs you may have while you're painting. Paint buildup and tip dry is just a part of airbrushing, so if you notice it happening, you could press down on the trigger and pull back on this rear handle like this to quickly flush out any clogs. But if you press down for air and quickly pull back on the trigger like I'm doing here, 
you get the exact same effect. So while these cutaway handles look really cool, I don't find them useful. I never use it and I'm always painting without the rear handle anyway. That way I have much quicker and easier access to that needle. I love this floating nozzle design. It makes it really easy to break down and clean if you need to and also very easy to swap out when you need to replace it. The only con that I have with the HPCS is that there's a very sharp angle within this nozzle that can easily collect paint if you're not careful. As you can see, I'm pressing this needle in and I'm hitting like a lip or a bit of an edge of metal in there before I get through to the nozzle head itself. 99% of the time you're not going to have any problems with this. It sprays wonderfully. But what's happened to me a few times is that some dried paint from the bottle got into my airbrush and then it got caught along this lip inside the nozzle and it's really a pain to clean out. I still love this nozzle design just because it's so easy to take apart and clean if you need to. Just be careful not to get dried paint in it. Moving along to the trigger response, just like all Iwatas, the Eclipse HPCS is outstanding. If you look at my finger, you could barely even see that I'm pulling back on it. Just the slightest nudge on it releases paint. So I would say the response rate for this is perfect. With the spray consistency test, the Eclipse is outstanding. Spraying this thin line, there's no breaks or stutters in it. It's just doing a perfect job at spraying a consistent line and the paint is always flowing. For painting fine lines, this airbrush excels just because the control is so great. You pull back a tiny bit on that trigger, you get paint. But with an airbrush like the Iwata Eclipse or even the Neo, you're going to have to hold it very close to the surface to get a line as thin as you get from a micron. And that's just because the spray angle is a little bit wider. You can get just as much detail as a micron or any detail airbrush with the uh, Eclipse. You just have to be closer to the surface. You'll notice at 20 PSI that the airspeed is much higher than a detail airbrush like the Micron or even the last one we looked at, the Neo for Iwata. So if you're using this for detail work, you can lower your PSI to 15 or so, but you also have to reduce your paint because you're gonna be painting with lower pressure. But a benefit of that higher airspeed is that you could spray paint right out of the bottle like what I'm doing here, and it just sprays it absolutely perfectly. The thing that I love about the Eclipse is that it's just so forgiving. You could use basically any airbrush paint right out of the bottle and start spraying right away. It's going to do a perfect job every single time. And then when you want to switch over to detail work, just reduce your paint, drop your PSI, and the Eclipse works very well as a detail airbrush. In this little landscape sketch, I had no problems painting with it. All the paint is Createx Illustration Colors sprayed directly from the bottle at 20 PSI and it sprayed perfectly. No graininess, no clogs. This is just what you want from any airbrush. You definitely feel a higher airspeed compared to the Neo. Again, I think that's just personal preference, whether you like that or not. It is gonna help you spray those thicker paints and it should be more forgiving in the long term. Even if you're painting something smaller like this little painting here, I have no problem getting in close and getting in that detail. I don't think there's much more I have to say about the Eclipse. It's a legend for a reason. Definitely an airbrush worth considering. The next airbrush up is a newer one for me, and this is another Iwata. It's the High Performance Plus HPB. I had my eye on the High Performance line for a long time, and the price dropped on Amazon to around 160 US dollars, which was a great price, so I had to pick it up. This one definitely has that Iwata build quality. Everything looks great and feels really nice in the hand. Just like the Eclipse that we looked at, the rear handle has a cutaway and you could use that to flush the airbrush if you want to. And also on the back here, you have a trigger stop or a needle limiter. I think I want to call this their preset feature. And if you screw this down, it's going to lock the needle at a certain point. So when you pull back, you're always getting the same amount of paint. If you tighten it all the way down like this, you'll see that I can't even pull back on the trigger at all. So it's a cool feature if you want to preset your needle to a certain point. I never use these, but if you're new to airbrush painting, you may find this helpful because it's a simple little screw that you screw down and it's going to prevent you from spraying too much paint. This Iwata High Performance Plus, which is the HPB, has a needle and nozzle size of 0.2 millimeters. This needle and nozzle size is very close to an Iwata Micron, which is 0.18 millimeters but this airbrush sprays a lot closer to an Iwata Eclipse than it does to a Micron. And just like every other airbrush in this video, if you wanna watch the full review of this one, make sure you check out my playlist of airbrush reviews. Every one of these will be on that. The one thing that I consider to be a negative is just like the Neo for Iwata, you have that old school screw-in nozzle. When I'm painting with this, obviously there's no issues. It sprays great. The only problems I have are when you have to remove it to clean it out. It's just, there's nothing there to grab onto. It's this tiny little grain of rice sized nozzle, easy to lose and easy to break. And if you have an airbrush with a nozzle like this, definitely pick up one of these Iwata wrenches. 
It's made specifically for this type of nozzle and kind of holds it in place as you're removing it. The response rate on this airbrush is ridiculously good. If you look at my trigger finger, you'll see how far back I have to pull to get a small amount of paint. It's basically nothing. It may be possible that this type of nozzle design lends to better trigger control. I don't know. I'm not an airbrush designer or an engineer. But all I can say is that this is really as good as it gets. This trigger control may be slightly better than the Iwata Eclipse. It's so hard to tell. All I could say is that I'd be very happy with either one. They're both phenomenal. Moving along to the line consistency test, this airbrush is spraying perfectly. There's no sort of jitters or splatters within the paint, and we have one consistent line, so I'm very happy with this. Now the spray angle on the HPB is a lot tighter than what you get from the Eclipse but it still feels like an eclipse to me just because the airspeed is higher. So you're definitely feeling that air blowing back off the surface. It's a little bit easier to spray a very thin line with this than the Iwata Eclipse, but I still think a Micron is much better suited for detail work just because of that airspeed. So switching right from the Iwata Eclipse to this, it feels very similar. It's not a huge step like going from the Iwata Eclipse to the Micron. That you really feel there's a big difference in the amount of detail you can get. With this, you can still get plenty of detail. You could spray it just as tight as a Micron, but you're going to have to be a bit closer to the surface than you do with a true detail airbrush. But a benefit that the HPB has over the Micron is that I could spray some thicker paint through it and not really have any issues with it. On this little landscape here, I'm spraying this directly from the bottle at 20 PSI and it feels great. There's a slight bit of graininess to this blue color, which is blue violet, but if I was painting a real painting, I would reduce this at least 20% with distilled water and that would clear it right up. Since the spray angle on the HPB is slightly more acute than what you have with the Iwata Eclipse, I don't need to be as close to the surface to get the same amount of detail that I do with the Eclipse. But compared to a Micron, I have to be a lot closer. So again, I don't think this is a substitute for a true detail airbrush, but it is still a phenomenal airbrush that could do pretty much anything. Moving along to a real painting I was working on, I switched over to the HPB from the Micron because I broke it during this painting and the HPB worked really, really well. Again, I just wish that airspeed was slightly lower at a higher PSI, but that's the way this airbrush is designed. It works well, it sprays great, so definitely an airbrush to check out. The next airbrush up is another legend in my opinion, and this of course is the Badger Patriot 105. The Patriot 105 has a larger needle and nozzle size at 0.5 millimeters. I would say that this airbrush is a direct competitor to the Iwata Eclipse HPCS. This airbrush is built very well, very solid, and it's extremely comfortable for those longer painting sessions. One thing you need to be aware about before buying a Badger is that they have their own thread size for connecting the air hose. On this model, I put on a quick adapter that I bought directly from Badger. And this adapter only screws into Badger airbrushes, but it'll connect to the female end of any other quick adapter. Like I use the Iwata one on my Iwata air hose, and this connects in perfectly. In terms of ergonomics, I think Badger makes some of the best airbrushes out there. A perfect example is their rear handle design, which in my opinion is the best out of any other airbrush brand. It has a cutaway if you want to use that to flush the airbrush, but more importantly, you have access to the needle with the handle still on. Now, why is it so important to have easy access to the needle while you're painting? You'll notice sometimes you'll press down on the airbrush trigger just for air without pulling back, and you'll notice that it'll start to release some paint. There's two reasons that cause this. One is that you have your needle spring too loose. This is why I always tighten mine down all the way. If you tighten it down on the back, it just helps create a better seal with the needle and the nozzle. And the second and more common reason is that some paint built up within the nozzle and the needle and nozzle head are just not making a great seal. So the easiest way to fix this is just to reseat your needle within the nozzle head. On my Awada Eclipse, the way I need to do this is by removing the handle, then slightly unscrewing the needle chuck, pulling the needle out a small amount, pressing it back in, rotating it, and tightening it back down. So for me, an airbrush handle just gets in the way. It's the reason I never paint with one. It also makes it a lot easier for me to clean when I'm flushing out colors. It's just nicer to remove the needle and kind of flush everything out. And with the handle on, it's just an extra step. But with Badger airbrushes, I could leave this handle on and I can access the chuck right here, pull out the needle, place it back in and screw it down. They also place a small little ball at the end of the needle to make it easier to grab. And for me, this is one of the simple reasons that I love Badger airbrushes. It seems like they were thinking about 
what can be fixed, what can be added to make airbrush painting easier. And with little things like this, just a handle where you could access the needle just makes the whole painting process so much easier. And I think the best example of all these small features coming together is the Badger Sotar 2020, which in my opinion is one of the best airbrushes ever made. And I'll be talking about that one next week when we focus on detail airbrushes. So let's talk about some of the negatives. First of all is the finish and the build quality. It's nowhere near what you'd get from a brand like Harder and Steenbeck. The internal parts on Badger airbrushes feel much cheaper than what you see in Iwata's or Harder and Steenbeck. I'm not saying they're bad, they work just fine, but they're just not up there with the same build quality. And in my experience, Badger airbrushes are the most difficult to break down and clean. But with that said, once you own a Badger airbrush and you understand all the internal parts, it's not that bad, you get used to it. And the only other thing that I'm not crazy about on the Badger Patriot 105 is this nozzle head design. The cap on the end is not far out enough to protect the needle, and it's also not far in enough to easily access the tip of the needle to remove tip dry. Removing dried paint on the tip of your airbrush needle is something you always need to do while you're painting. So with Badger airbrushes, what I used to do is just carry an old toothbrush around and just use it with some water to brush off the end. The air regulators are really cool on Badger airbrushes. There's about six holes on them, which evenly spray the air over that nozzle head. And the nozzle itself is outstanding. It's a floating nozzle, very easy to remove and replace, and also super easy to clean. And the inside of this nozzle is very smooth. There's no sort of edges or sharp angles in it, like what you see in the Iwata Eclipse. So I actually find this nozzle very forgiving, and you don't have to worry about paint building up within it. If you're looking for responsiveness in an airbrush trigger, Badger is one of the best out there. I've said before that in my experience, I think the most responsive airbrush I've ever used in my life is the Sotar 2020, and the Badger Patriot 105 is very similar to that. If you look at my trigger finger here, you could see I'm barely even pulling back. It looks like I'm not moving it at all. It's just phenomenal response rate. You may notice that these dots and lines are larger than the previous airbrushes. That's because the Patriot 105 has a larger nozzle size at 0.5 millimeters. With the paint consistency test, this airbrush is excellent, just like the previous ones. No sort of skips or splatters within the line, and it's a continuous flow the whole way through. Now, the Patriot 105 is definitely not designed as a detail airbrush because it has that larger nozzle size. But you can see here, if I'm trying to paint in thin lines, if I hold this right off the surface, I can get excellent detail with it. With a higher air speed and wider spray angle, this airbrush excels at spraying thicker paint. If you don't want to deal with reducing paint and want to spray any airbrush paint right out of the bottle, the Patriot 105 is definitely the airbrush for you. Out of any airbrush in this video, I think the Patriot 105 is the most forgiving airbrush. It's going to spray any airbrush paint perfectly all day long. And it's really forgiving for other paints. I don't recommend doing this, but I once sprayed some house paint that I needed to add onto the back of a canvas. I sprayed it through this and you know, it's something you shouldn't do, but it just sprayed amazing. It's just such a great airbrush. So if you're going to be spraying some thicker applications of paint, things like varnishes or base coats, this is definitely one of the best airbrushes in the video to consider. And if you're using the Patriot 105 for art, I think it works very well when you're working on larger applications, things like murals. If you're getting in and painting smaller portraits like this one that I'm working on now, it's not the best airbrush because it puts out a lot of paint. But when you're adding in masses of value, maybe like in darker areas like the hair or the background itself, this is definitely a great airbrush for that. Just like the Iwata Eclipse, I consider the Badger Patriot 105 to be a legendary airbrush, and it's one that I'd always recommend to anybody. The next airbrush up is definitely a unique one. This is the Badger Extreme Patriot 105. Now the extreme version of the Patriot 105 is very similar to the original. It just has a few differences that set it apart. The first thing you'll notice is this high trigger. Badger calls this the high roller trigger. And since it's longer, the arc is gonna be farther. So you're gonna have to pull back on it a bit more than a normal airbrush to get paint which should give you greater control. I feel I have much more control with the shorter trigger, but I do love this addition because this is not a permanent trigger. You could take this one out and swap it with the shorter one, like the one that comes with the Badger Patriot 105, and more options are a great thing in airbrush painting, so I think this is a good addition. I think some people may really like this. Again, it's not permanent, so if you don't like it, you could swap it out. The Extreme Patriot 105 comes with an adapter, which is a great touch, so you could just add this on, and then it will fit any standard airbrush hose. And with this adapter, you could add on one of the standard quick adapters. So if you have those lying around, it just makes it a lot easier. The needle and nozzle size is 0.3 millimeters on the extreme version of the Patriot 105. So you could almost consider this like a detail version of the traditional Patriot 105. 
because you have a smaller needle and nozzle, and also you have easier access to that needle. The needle tip is fully exposed on this one, so it's super easy to clean off tip dry. And this airbrush also has that excellent rear handle design that you see in all other Badger airbrushes. The build quality is exactly the same as the Badger Patriot 105. All the internals are identical. The one major problem with this airbrush is this small screw on the front, which allows you to regulate the air pressure at the nozzle. Iwata calls these MAC valves, which is an acronym for micro air control valves, and Badger calls this a pack valve for precision air control. If you tighten this down, you're going to limit the airflow that flows to the nozzle so you could adjust your air pressure on the fly at the front of the airbrush. The problem with this design is that there's no sort of seal, gasket, or piston in there. It's just a screw right into the airline. And as expected, this opening in the airbrush just constantly leaks air. Other airbrushes that have MAC valves on them work the same, but they're built completely differently. When you adjust the screw on a true MAC valve, you are moving a small piston within this small cylinder, and that's sealed by a gasket. I've never had any airbrushes with real MAC valves on them leak air. Now, I bought this model about five years ago. I've probably only painted maybe 20, 30 hours with it. I noticed that leak pretty early on and I just never really used it. It just sat in the drawer. Unless Badger redesigned this over the last five years, I think the only solution to this would be just to completely remove it from the airbrush. One thing about painting with any sort of air system is you never ever want any sort of air leak within the line. That begins with your compressor and your tank to your regulator, hose, moisture traps, quick adapters, and airbrush. You could check any of these seals by placing some soapy water on them. If you see bubbles, that means there's a leak. Besides that broken pack valve, I would say that this airbrush sprays pretty well. If this issue is fixed on the newer versions, I think this is definitely a cool airbrush, one to consider. But if this problem isn't addressed or fixed, I would just skip this one and go with a much better original Badger Patriot 105. The next airbrush up is one made by GSI Creos, and this is called the PS276. The first thing that you probably noticed is that the paint cup is on the side of the airbrush. When I'm painting, personally, I don't mind if I'm using a gravity feed or a side feed. They're both the same for me. It doesn't really make a difference, but one of the reasons I like a side feed is that it's a lot easier to clean at the end of a painting session. After removing the paint and then spraying some distilled water through the airbrush, you could just remove the cup like this and then just flush everything out. I like to use distilled water first in a spray bottle and just spray it right through the paint cup, then also in these holes on the side just to flush out any paint that may be building up. Now this airbrush is a side feed, but I'd consider it a gravity side feed or gravity assisted because this pulls the paint from the bottom of the cup just like a traditional gravity airbrush, and then it pulls it through the side into the nozzle. The older versions of side feed airbrushes were like this cup on the right side of the screen, which is basically siphon fed. The paint had to be sucked up through that hole from the bottom of this paint cup sitting on the side of the airbrush. This type of side feed is also what you see in the Iwata Takumi line, which includes the Takumi Eclipse and the Custom Micron Takumi. Since the side feed is gravity assisted, you're not going to need to bump up your PSI in order to paint. The PS276 has a 0.3 millimeter needle and nozzle. That's a perfect size for general use airbrushing. You'll be able to get in close, spray in detail work, and also it'll be more forgiving for some of those thicker paints. No cutaway on the rear handle, which is fine for me, and the back also has one of these needle limiters. So if you want to use that, the option's there. Now this company, GSI Creos, is kind of new to me. The first one I bought was the PS771, which is a detail airbrush, and I bought that about three years ago now and I really fell in love with it. It's a phenomenal airbrush. So I wanted to pick up a GSI Creos for some wider spray applications, and this one fit the bill perfectly. I will have a full review on this airbrush sometime in the future, but as of now, I've been testing it for the last month or so. I really, really love it. Excellent build quality. These feel very similar to Iwata's. One of the negatives that I noticed about this airbrush in the last month or so is that paint tends to collect in these side holes where the cup connects. But as long as you remove the cup and then flush out these holes at the end of your painting session, you won't have any issues with it. One thing I noticed about GSI Creos airbrushes is that their trigger is very, very soft. I can almost guarantee you that 99% of the users using GSI Creos airbrushes will love this. It feels very comfortable. But for me, I just got used to using a tighter trigger. Even when I tighten the screw down on the back all the way, it just feels a bit too soft for me. And in no way am I implying that this is a negative part of the airbrush. They're definitely designed this way. I think a lot of thought went into this to make them soft like that. But for the way I paint, I just prefer more tension on the trigger. I'm not a fan of any sort of soft spring or anything like that. And moving along to the response rate, this thing just sprays like an Iwata to me. Absolutely perfect. Again, pay attention to my finger. You'll see I'm barely pulling back at all to get some paint to come out. 
And the nozzle design on this one is very similar to the other Iwata that we looked at, which was the HPB. The line consistency test was very good. I noticed a few jitters in it. I was spraying at 20 PSI, just like every other airbrush that I reviewed so far in this video. But if I bumped that up to maybe 25 or so, I'm sure that would have fixed it. I'll check this again when I get to the full review of this airbrush, but it really sprayed great. I mean, no issues at all. You could even see here while I'm spraying some thin lines, it sprang them perfectly. For this little landscape painting, which was the last painting lesson on this channel, I actually used this airbrush to paint in the entire sky. I wanted a very smooth gradient on this sky, a darker blue on top to a lighter blue down at the bottom. And I started with some transparent colors, cobalt blue and some Payne's gray. Sprayed a bit more on the top where I got that darker value and then less as I got closer to the mountain. And I also sprayed some opaque white. I believe I sprayed that right out of the bottle with no reducer a bit more toward the bottom here to help soften that gradient up. And this airbrush with a 0.3 millimeter needle and nozzle worked amazing. It got such a great smooth gradient there. This is exactly what I bought it for to spray in some larger areas like this and still get that control. And it worked perfect. So I was very pleased with this GSI Creos. This is without a doubt a high quality general use side feed airbrush. The next airbrush up is another general use airbrush, but this one's for wider applications. And this is the Iwata HPTH. The first thing you'll probably notice with this one is that the trigger is not on the top, but it's on the lower side of the airbrush. The HPTH is also dual action. When you pull back on the trigger a small amount, you start to get air. And then as you pull back farther, you'll feel a bit of tension. And then from there, it's gonna start releasing the paint. Since this airbrush is designed for spraying a higher volume of paint, you have a much larger paint cup on the top at 15 milliliters, which is about a half of an ounce. A nice bonus feature is that this cup is also removable. So if you wanna place a much larger one on, you know, if you're painting something very large, like a mural or something, you're able to do that. The HPTH also has a Mac valve on it. This is a true Mac valve. It works very well. You can adjust the pressure at the front of your airbrush by tightening this in or loosening it up. The rear handle of the airbrush also has Iwata's preset feature. So if you tighten this down, you're able to limit how far back you can pull the trigger. A very cool feature is that you can change the cap. It comes with two, both a fan cap and a round cap. With the fan cap on, you could spray a much wider spray pattern. This is good for base coats or for varnishing a painting. And with the round cap on, you have a much tighter spray pattern. This airbrush is easy to control, but it definitely puts out a high volume of paint. And of course, if you want to learn more about this airbrush, make sure you check out my full review of it. For this landscape painting that I completed a few months ago, I used the Iwata HPTH for some of the foreground right here in this section where the rocks are. It sprayed very well, but for me, it just puts out too much paint. And that's really what it's designed for. It's for painting large scale things. Like if you're gonna work on murals or if you're gonna you know, varnish a whole large painting at the end, it's kind of a, like a replacement for an HVLP or an LVLP spray gun. So definitely a great airbrush to consider if you're looking to spray higher volumes of paint like base coating or varnishing. The next airbrush up is the Pache Talon. Now I'm not sure if this name is pronounced Pache or Pash, so I'm going to say Pache through this. If I'm wrong, just correct me and I'll fix it for the full review. I've heard about this brand for years and years. I just never got around to buying one. I saw this on sale on Amazon for like $60 a few weeks ago, so I picked it up to review for this channel. I thought for $60 this was going to be a cheaper airbrush, but I was completely wrong. This airbrush is incredibly solid and it feels really nice. It feels like a professional painting tool. In the hand, this feels very similar to the Iwata Eclipse and the Badger Patriot 105. And the finishing on this is pretty good. I'd say very similar to Badger airbrushes, but it's definitely not Iwata or harder than Steambeck quality. Again, it's half the price of those, so I have zero complaints with it. Just like every other airbrush, if you remove the rear handle, you can tighten this screw down right here to adjust the tension on the trigger. And I have to say that the feel of this trigger is outstanding. I don't like soft triggers or soft springs, anything like that. I like a lot of tension on the trigger. For me, when I'm painting, I just feel like I have a lot more control. More tension on the trigger allows me to easily place the needle exactly where I want it to be. But I tend to be kind of heavy handed when I paint or draw, but to me, this feels perfect. But of course, if you want lighter spring tension, you could just unscrew this screw and that'll loosen everything up. The needle size on the Talon is 0.38 millimeters. So again, this is kind of in that sweet spot. It's gonna allow you to paint in detail, but also if you wanna paint those thicker paints, it's gonna help you with that. The rear handle has a cutaway if you wanna quickly flush the airbrush. And also you have a needle limiter on the back if you wanna use that. This airbrush has a large half ounce paint cup. And also there's an etching of an eagle on it, which I thought was really cool. So it's a nice touch. 
The front of this airbrush has a very chunky and solidly built nozzle, and the nozzle cap comes to a very sharp point, which is great when you're getting in close for detail work. One of the negatives is that this airbrush has its own thread size for connecting the air hose. This is similar to what you see in Badger airbrushes, but unfortunately, this isn't the same one that you see on Badger airbrushes, so I had to pick up a small quick adapter. I bought this one on Amazon for a few dollars. It's a third party version, but it works well. The response rate on this airbrush is very good. From my tests, it seems that you have to pull back a little bit farther on the trigger than you do with Badger airbrushes or um, Iwata's. But again, this feels very comfortable. It starts spraying at the same point, just a little bit farther back on the trigger. And with the spray consistency test, this airbrush is incredible perfect line the whole way through and also you can get some very thin lines if you hold it pretty close to the surface. As I said this airbrush is new for me it's only a few weeks old but so far I'm very impressed with what I see. I will have a full review of this airbrush coming up in the future. From what I see now I'm very happy with it. I want to try it out on some real paintings, see how it works on some portraits, maybe a landscape. But even in early testings at 60 or 70 US dollars, this has to be one of the best options out there for a sub $100 airbrush. Very, very impressive. And the last airbrushes up are the inexpensive budget ones. This video is much longer than I want it to be, so I'm grouping these together, but just know that I have full reviews of each of these airbrushes on my channel. I think these inexpensive airbrushes are a great place to start, and they're also good to have as a backup airbrush. I'm well aware that there's plenty of people that don't want to spend two, $300 on an airbrush. Maybe they're just testing out, or they're only going to use it once or twice a year. The first one up is a Central Pneumatic that you can buy at Harbor Freight. I'd say out of any airbrush on the table, this one feels the cheapest, but also it's the cheapest price. You can buy this one for around $20 and then like 15 or 16 US dollars with a coupon at Harbor Freight. I have a full review of this airbrush on my channel, so make sure you check that one out. The next airbrush up is the Point Zero. I wanted to find the cheapest airbrush that you can buy today, so on Amazon I searched airbrushes by price. I found this one for like 16 or 17 US dollars a few months ago. And these cheaper airbrushes spray great. Anything that I can do with an Iwata Eclipse or a Badger Patriot 105, I can do with these cheaper and expensive airbrushes. And that's not exaggeration or hyperbole. But the main negative about these airbrushes is that they're just not built that well. They feel kind of cheap. The internal parts are not that great. They feel a bit grainy. But the positive is that they still spray excellent. And when you're using an airbrush, that's the most important part. I will have a review of this Master Airbrush coming up soon. This is such a cool brand because they sell all their parts on Amazon. You could buy like kits of all their seals and needles, really cheap. It's just so nice to have all those parts on hand. Everyone seems to have strong opinions on these inexpensive budget airbrushes, but I think they're a great place to start and definitely great to have as a backup airbrush. So that's gonna complete part one of my airbrush buyer's guide, which focused on general use airbrushes. Next week in the second part, we're just gonna be looking at the detail airbrushes. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.